Okay, so today we're going to talk about Grotrian diagrams. Kind of a strange name. I don't know if, I guess it was a person's name. I'm not exactly sure. But throughout this whole semester, we've been talking about lines and levels, right? The spectral lines are what we see in the spectrum, and the energy level diagram for the particle in a box was just the plot of those energy levels that went up as n squared. For rotational levels, we had levels that went up as j squared. For vibrational levels, we had the parabola with equally spaced vib um, energy levels. And so the energy levels have been pretty simple, all right? You have some sort of, uh, maybe like for vibration, you have a potential energy surface and you have the equally spaced vibrational lines, or sorry, vibrational levels. Uh, for the particle in a box, you had the square box with vertical walls and you had the uh, unequally spaced energy levels that went up as n squared. We didn't really show a potential energy surface for rotation because it's free rotation. There's no potential surface for free rotation. We just draw the energy levels just as levels. There's no picture of the of the uh, potential energy surface. And the same thing for atoms. The electron cloud is free around the atom. Uh, it does have the Coulombic attraction, which keeps the electrons close to the nucleus, but we don't draw any kind of potential energy on the, on the uh, atomic energy levels, but we do separate them by their term symbols. And we're gonna figure out what that means in the future lecture. So today we're starting with that energy level diagram called a Grotrian diagram. So for atomic energy levels, it's called a Grotrian diagram, not just an energy level diagram. So that's what this is, is energy level diagrams for atoms. Here's the hydrogen atomic spectrum. This is the, one of the things that that required quantum mechanics. This was unexplainable with classical physics. They, they, they thought of an electron as a negative charge around a nucleus so that it should be able to have any energy and it couldn't. Obviously, we saw specific transitions in the visible spectrum and we couldn't explain it. And so then the, the wave theory was proposed by de Broglie, the math was done by Schrodinger and he solved the hydrogen atom and that was the first sort of foray into quantum mechanics. Uh, we can see now we've assigned the spectra. We have the Boltzmann distribution term that's based upon n equals five. And then we have this uh, emission spectrum from five down to two. So it's going from five down to two, spitting out X, Y, or Z polarized light. And so we have that transition dipole moment integral that Schrodinger solved and he solved for the intensity of this, these different lines. Notice uh, that if that temperature is not very hot or not hot enough to have uh, hydrogen atoms up in the N equals five level, then we won't have an emission spectrum. So emission spectrum, at least in this case, requires some sort, well, all emission spectra require some excitation because the this system has to be in excited state before it can emit light. Um, it's hard to get it there with just regular old temperature, so a lot of times this happens in a flame. So you're burning something and you put the atom in a flame or some sort of hot environment so that you get an emission spectrum out. And that's what we do with flame atomic absorption. So flame atomic absorption, we have a cathode ray tube that has an excited element that's emitting light, characteristic of that element. And then you have a nebulizer that sucks up cold atoms from your sample and those atoms come up in the flame and you don't want the flame to be hot enough to ionize your analyte. It comes up and it absorbs the light from the cathode ray tube. So we have emission from the cathode ray tube and then we have absorption from your, from your atoms that are in a cold uh, natural gas flame or acetylene flame. Now over at TRIES, they have an inductively coupled plasma uh, optical emission spectrometer, and there your analyte is the source. So it goes into this argon plasma that is between 10 and 20,000 Kelvin. So it really excites those atoms up into their excited states and then they emit light. And then we have different positions for the detectors to look for the different elements. If they're looking for lead and drinking water, then they have um, this computer looking where the emission of lead would be. Now here's the broader view of the hydrogen spectrum. The different scientists who discovered these different sets of lines are named here. So we have the Brackett, Passion, Balmer, and Lyman series. This is the total spectrum of, of hydrogen. Notice it's a really broad spectrum in wavelength and nanometer. So this is definitely uh, 
UV down here. This is the visible range, and then this is the near infrared. And so all of these different lines that we saw in the hydrogen spectrum, they, they thought, well, this looks like a, you know, a, this decreasing pattern looks like a one over something pattern. And so Rydberg figured out that uh, you could do one over n squared and match this pattern in terms of energy. But he didn't understand what the n meant. So we, he actually discovered quantum numbers, but he didn't know that you know, energy was quantized. He just said, well, it fits this integer series of n values and it's one over n squared. And sure enough, that was the energy equation, but he did not, um, he did not know what those quantum numbers meant or why energy would be quantized. Let me turn my phone off here. Okay. Let me just check something too. Yes. Okay. So this is a, a better picture. This is the spectrum here. These are the spectral lines, and here are the energy levels. And so here are the quantum numbers over here on the right. And you see for large jumps, so from all of these, these are emission lines. So when hydrogen atoms are up here and N equals two, three, four, five, or six level, they can emit down to one. And because these are really long arrows, these are really short wavelengths. So these are all UV. So the Balmer series are not connected to the ground state. They're, they're sort of in the middle here. This is the N equals three down to two, four down to two, five down to two, and six down to two. Those are the visible lines that we see in the hydrogen spectrum that we can actually detect with our eyes. And then the passion and bracket uh, series are in the near IR. What's interesting is this explained also what they call Fraunhofer lines. So if you look at a, a, if you take a spectrometer and aim it at the sun, you see a continuum, you see a black body radiator. So the, the temperature of the sun, you get this, this uh, smear of all wavelengths. So that's where you, this rainbow, if you split it out and look at it um, in a detector. But then if you have a high resolution detector and you scan through there, there's some dark lines in it. And it's really strange. It's like, where these, where's this light going? It's missing. So if you think of the sun as a black body, and it's emitting all wavelengths of light based upon that Planck distribution of, of energies, where are these black lines from? Well, as the gas is ejected from the sun, it cools as it emits its light. And now these gases are in the, in the ground state and we're actually seeing the atmosphere of the sun. It's absorbing the sun's light as it exits. And we see these dips. And so we can look at this atomic spectroscopy and we can see these dips in the solar spectrum and we can see what the sort of atmosphere, the gases coming, getting blown out of the sun's corona, what they are. And we can characterize some of the composition of the sun. And so we've done this. We've got spectrometers hooked to our really, uh, you know, uh, fancy uh, telescopes and we can sit on a star and look for a while and collect light and see what its brightness is and what its composition is. We also see some lines for oxygen and nitrogen, and that's our atmosphere. So as the, as the solar light is coming in and coming into the upper atmosphere where we have single atoms like nitrogen and oxygen atoms, uh, we can see their absorption spectrum too. So these energy levels in a Grotrian diagram, this is obviously a, a big point because I've got it as big a type as I could fit on the page almost, that these are energies of the whole atom. Now it's a little confusing for hydrogen because there's just one electron. So when we have the hydrogen in an excited state where that electron is say in a 3D orbital, then there are no other electrons on there. So the whole atom is essentially the, the energy of that 3D orbital. But when you get to multi-electron uh, atoms, you might have an electron in the 1S and an electron in a 3D and you'll have a particular energy, but that's not the energy of the 3D orbital because there's also an electron in the 1S orbital. So it's the energy, the whole atom. And that's really important point. 
Okay, it's very confusing though, because the first one we look at is the hydrogen atom. And in that case, it really is kind of the, the energies of those orbitals. But once we go to multi-electron, then it's the energy of the whole atom. And really in all cases, it's the energy of the whole atom. Since hydrogen only has one electron, you put it in a 3D orbital, that raises the energy of the whole atom. So it's incorrect to treat these energy levels as individual orbital energy levels. So here's the Grotrian diagram for hydrogen. Anytime, anytime you have a plot, always look at the axes and see what's being plotted. Obviously, the, the vertical axis is energy. These are energy levels. But what are the groups as we go across? These are lowercase s, p, d, and f. So these are electron configurations for the hydrogen atom. So if, if we're in this energy level right here, then it's hydrogen with a 3D1. So that's the energy of a 3D1 hydrogen. Um, two, three, four, five, six. So up here, this is hydrogen. Uh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So hydrogen. Uh, 8d1 is that top energy level okay and it's just they haven't drawn anymore just because the it gets too close together so the first available f orbital is a is a 4f so this is hydrogen with a 4f1 right there so that's the energy of that atom as an electron in the 4f orbital now these arrows in this energy level diagram, those are going to be spectral lines. So those, those black lines in this plot are energy levels. The differences, the arrows, are spectral lines, as we've been showing this whole semester. So the Grotrian diagram shows the energy levels. They're sorted by N and L. So going from the lowest, N equals 1 for 1S, and then N equals 2, 3, 4. This is a hydrogen atom, so we can see that there's no energetic difference between the S and the P, right? So there's no energy dependence upon the angular momentum quantum numbers in the hydrogen only. Now the selection rules. Can you look at this? Don't che cheat and look at your notes, but look at this. Uh, energy level diagram, can you tell me what the selection rules are? In other words, what is there any restriction on N? Well, let's look to see what we have here. This is an N equals 2. This, this line right here is an N equals 2 down to 1. So we know that N can change by 1, from 2 to 1. But the next one is N equals 3 down to 1. And then the next one is n equals 4 down to 1. So it looks like there's no restriction on n like there was in the particle in a box, where it was delta n plus or minus 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. You couldn't have the even changes, 2 and 4 and 6. But in this case, it looks like n is unrestricted. And sure enough, the principal quantum number is unrestricted. So it can be anything. Uh, it can even be 0, so we can put 0 in there. So what would be a, a delta n equals zero? It would be like a transition from a, a 3p to a 3s, right? The 3 and the 3 are n, so that's a delta n equals zero. So there's no change in m, but there is a change in l. Okay, so let's look at this uh, Grotrian diagram. Can we determine what the l selection rules are looking at this chart? So remember, these, are, these, these letters are l. L is equal to 0 for an s orbital, 1 for a p orbital, 2 for a d orbital, and 3 for an f orbital. And that's lowercase l. And that's important. In this part of this course, little l and big l are different. <laughs> okay, when we get to term symbols, we're going to have a capital L. So uh, the angular momentum quantum numbers for individual electrons and so on are, are lowercase l. So look at those arrows. What are they doing? They're shifting by one column, aren't they? So they're going either from the, the P column over to the S column or from the D column over to the P column. And so that's changing in plus or minus one L. So the angular momentum quantum number is restriction, restricted. It's delta L equals plus or minus one. So we can go from a P to S or an S to a P. We can go from a D to a P and a P to a D, but 
you know, we can't go from a D all the way down to an S. Yes. So I know it says you can go up or down by one. Is there a reason this diagram only shows them going down? Yeah, because this is just emission. But yeah, we could do absorption as well. So if we had cold hydrogen atoms out there, then they could be arrows going up. So great question. And, and the F isn't shown, but it exists as well. So we could have this transition here. Okay, it's just not shown. It's not showing everything. Um, but occasionally you'll see exceptions in the Grotrian diagram, but these are the major rules. The N is unrestricted, but the delta L plus or minus one only, that's the, that's the major um, trend. It's pretty rare, and sometimes they'll draw it with like a dashed line, a D to an S, right? And they'll say, well, there's a, there's a weak line that we saw in this uh, one particular uh, spectrum of an atom and it's you know the only thing that really matches is the D to S transition but that's pretty rare uh, it's the um, what I don't think so <laughs> zoom no I don't think we need zoom right now okay so <laughs> so Delta L plus or minus one that's our that's our quantum number and again this has to do with the photon having one angle one unit of angular momentum and so it makes sense that it can cause the atom to change either going up in the angular momentum or going down in angular momentum now let's go to helium let's add a second electron and boy did things get complicated fast just the second atom in the periodic table and now we've got a crazy growth tree and diagram first of all it's split in half we have singlet states on the left and triplet states on the right. Now, what on earth is that about? That's multiplicity, okay? Because when you have two electrons, they can be spin paired up and down, or they can be spin unpaired. This is a singlet, this is a triplet, okay? And so the, the, those names singlet and triplet come from the, the spectra. We see fine structure that splits into singlets or triplets, kind of like you also see in NMR, but it's a different phenomenon. And there are some selection rules associated with that too. So this is a not a single electron system, so it's not hydrogenic, and we do start to see some energy differences between the, the S and P columns you see here. Uh, the ground state of helium is the alpha bow like electron configuration, so that what that means is that's the, the 1S2 down here. This is the energy level for the 1S2. So if that's the 1s2, what is this one? Can you figure that out? It's in the s column. So if I was to excite that elect that atom, what could I do with it? I have both electrons in the 1s orbital. If I want to keep electrons in s orbitals, but I want to make an excited helium atom, what can I do with that second electron? How many other kinds of orbitals do I have? A bunch, right? I could put it in the 2s orbital. So I could have one electron in the 1s orbital and the other electron in the 2s orbital, and that would be an excited atom. And that's what's going on here. So this one is 1s1, 2s1. So you see what I was saying by Wednesday, you need to be good with electron configurations because you need to understand what I'm writing here. I've got two electrons in my helium. That's simple. It's a neutral helium, so I'll go ahead and write helium. Okay, it's not charged. It's not a cation or anything like that. So I've got two electrons. Where do I put them? Well, if I put them in the, both in the 1s orbital, I have ground state helium. But if I put one in the 2s, one in the 1s, and they're spin paired still, I have a singlet helium that's excited. And that's what that energy level is. What do you think this one is? So this is, again, we could excite both electrons, but that would really be high in energy. So we're still just exciting one electron. So if instead of putting that electron in the 2s, where could I put it? Still in an s orbital. What would be the next energy level? 3s, exactly. So that's the 3s one. Yes? So can kind of confused about the numbering system on the side? Uh, going from zero down to negative 24.5. Yes. That's a little confusing because there's no arrows on these. 
So okay, yeah, so to see if it's going up or down. It's again, it really doesn't matter if it's going down, it's emission, if it's going up, it's absorption. So uh, these are just the the connections. These are showing the allowed transitions. And these are, um, uh, let's see, I think these actually are nanometers. So this is, um, so these are the spectral lines in nanometers. So this is a visible line here. This is a visible line. Uh, this is really, you know, deep UV, that's 51 nanometers, you know, and visible is 400 to 700. And so that we're not going to see those lines in the helium spectrum, but we would see this red line here. And uh, if you get a helium neon laser, this is the line that's that's being spit out. Okay. So. And so that's a D to P transition in that helium neon laser. So the excited states can be complicated, but once you, uh, we'll see in the Grotrian diagrams, typically down across the bottom, they have some, some helpers, okay? So here's what you would see if you look this up online, you would see these kinds of helpers that say, it's a 1S1 and then it's an NS1. So it's saying that whole column has this same kind of con construction. It has always one electron in the, in the 1S and the other electrons hopping all over the place. So it's either also in the 1s or in the 2s or in the 3s or the 4s. And there's a there's a 5, there's a 6, there's a 7. You know, it gets closer and closer together as you go up because of that coulombic attraction. That quantum number is in the denominator. And so as you raise that quantum number, it it gets bigger in the denominator and so the energy is getting less negative. And so it's it's coming up gradually. And now, what do they converge at? They converge at the ionization limit, where this electron completely leaves the atom. So up here, this um, this limit up here, where all of these things, well, it says it right here, ionization limit, okay? So these all approach that point and get closer and closer together and to where the energy goes to zero, and that's where that electron has been pulled off of the, um, off of the atom. Now, they've re, they've, shifted all the energy levels to make it relative to the ground state okay and so then when you get up to the ionization limit um here's 23 here's 24 this looks like around 25. so if you're looking at this um Grotrian diagram and you see all of these lines get closer and closer together and they're approaching this line right here that's the ionization limit if you've set this to zero then uh that first First ionization energy that we were talking about all of last lecture is equal to 25 EV in this particular picture. So that Grotrian diagram has these uh, levels that all kind of compress up to a line and that line is the ionization energy where you've pulled that electron off. Okay, let's get to the, the higher angular momentum ones. Here's a, a if you look down here, all of this column is a 1s1 and then an np1. So it has one electron in the p, and so the first available p orbital is the 2p, then the 3p, then the 4p. Um, so don't forget your um, your restrictions on L, right? You can't have a d orbital in the 2 subshell because d is equal to 2 and n equals 2. That, that, that L has to be one less than n. So um, you have to have at least an n equals three for a for a d orbital. So that's that's the first available d orbital, then the next one and the next one. Um, the f orbitals aren't shown on here, but they are also part of the Grotrian diagram. Uh, here's that dotted line I was showing you from the d to the s. Okay, it's a pretty weak line. All the strong lines are that delta l plus or minus one. Notice another thing that we don't have any lines except for this one, okay, um, going from a, from a triplet to a singlet. And so that's also a forbidden transition with the one exception on this particular slot. But we don't have any red lines going from, from you know, the triplet. So that one's forbidden.
And we'll find out later that the difference between this forbidden transition and not is the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence. And so the triplet to singlet transition is phosphorescence. And because it's forbidden, it, it, it's a statistically unfavored. And so the lifetime of that triplet state can be quite long, even seconds to minutes. And so the glow in the dark stuff that we have is a, is a triplet to singlet transitions. They get stuck in that triplet state. So this, um, let's look at this one here, this 1s, 2s, this triplet. So that's helium. There's a 1s orbital with a spin up electron. And here's a 2s orbital with a spin up electron. And over here, this one is helium with a 1s orbital and a spin up electron. It doesn't matter whether it's um, spin up or spin down. Um, and the other one is spin down. So you see, that's the only difference. These have the same exact electron configuration, 1s, 2s. And so that's what's, that's what's different from the left side and the right side is whether the electrons are spin up or spin down. So we can actually see those effects um, in the spectrum and we have to plot them uh, to keep track of them in the energy level diagrams. So before we get into anything more complicated, let's just make sure we understand helium. Now I've, I've labeled these term symbols here and this is just a way to keep track of, of these different electron configurations and uh, these, these uh, permutations, whether the spins are up or down or paired or not paired and so on. And so we're going to learn about those in a couple of lectures. So um, you can't learn term symbols without learning the electron configurations really well. And so we want to just emphasize these today in the Grotrian diagrams. Okay, so let's move on. This is pretty complicated in terms of the periodic table because when we get past helium, you can imagine all of the different types of orbitals that are available to these elements. You get more electrons in there and you have, um, you know, think about the, the electron configurations for chromium. You know, is it 4s2, 3d4, or 4s1, 3d5? And those energy levels are moving around. And so uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, sort of a, a government research arm that we have has prepared the actual uh, experimental spectra and created these energy level diagrams. And it's a database that you can search and it's the atomic spectra data database. And if you go there, there's this lines form. You can put in the element that you're searching for. Now it's a little strange in this case, um, the, the element, this shows mercury, but for ground state mercury, is actually written like this, HG with a with an I, or ground state Roman numeral one is the ground state, which again goes against freshman chemistry basic naming conventions, right? Mercury one is mercury one plus, but not on this database that's been made by a bunch of physicists, okay? <laughs> so, so anyway, that's just a really peculiar thing about this. If you want the ground state atom, you put in mercury one, or sodium one or whatever, and you're not talking about the cation, okay? And so just, uh, that's a peculiar thing, but that's the way it goes. Um, and then you can put in the range in which you want to um, pull in those energy levels and, and spectral lines. You can pick your units. You can retrieve the data, and this will show you the spectral lines. Um, you could also hit this down here and make Grotrian diagram. And it's, uh, it's a Java-based program. Again, some years it's, it's pretty glitchy. So what you get from that Grotrian diagram, uh, well, from the lines form, you get this. So these are all the spectral lines. Uh, these are in angstroms. So you convert, there's uh, um, 10 angstroms per nanometer. So you just move the decimal place one place for nanometers. So this would be 401.12 nanometers. So again, these are visible lines that we see for sodium. It shows the energy level for the lower state and the upper state. It shows the electron configuration for the lower state, the upper state. It shows all kinds of information and even this uh, emission efficiency, which would give you uh, an intensity value. 
And so it's pretty interesting. You could go through and you could get every kind of spectral line. So if we had that stellar spectroscopy and we wanted to find what that line was in that star way off, we could go to the Atomic Spectral Database and we could find the best candidate for that. If we have uh, an analytical lab or in your forensic lab and you have, uh, let's say you're not testing for lead, but you're looking at some kind of shattered glass uh, from the crime scene and you're looking for a, a more exotic element, neodymium or something that's in the glass. And let's say it's covered up by um, a common line like calcium. So you've got two spectral lines that are really close to each other and your spectrometer can't resolve them. We have lots of options for these lines. So you would come to the spectral database and try to find a spectral line for neodymium that's nowhere near a spectral line for calcium. And then you could go to that spot in the spectrum and test for the element that you want. So that's probably the most common use for the spectral database uh, for these atomic spectra is to find lines that get around the interferences that you have in your analytical spectrum. Here's the Grotrian diagram for sodium. So notice how they all converge on this one. This is the ionization limit here, and it's listed. So it's relative to the ground state sodium atom. So they put that zero there. So for the sodium atom, it is, if you look up there, it's the neon core 3s1. So that's our ground state. Uh, electron configuration for sodium and then they've set in this Grotrian diagram set that to zero and so then the, the ionization limit up here where we pull that electron completely off is listed as 41 449 so that's the ionization energy for sodium and then you have all of these spectral lines now this one particular line in red is shown here and that's in right in the middle of the visible spectrum it's yellow. It's in the yellow region of the spectrum. Uh, and so this is where this yellow light comes from in our street lights. So these are sodium street lights, sodium vapor street lights, and they're very yellow. Have you seen these at night? You see the yellow street lights? They're kind of getting away from them because they're just not very pleasing, <laughs> but they're dirt cheap. And so they've gone, like here's a picture from Santa Rosa that I just typed in sodium, uh, high pressure sodium lights, and I got a bunch of Im Google images. And so this is from the city of Santa Rosa showing how before with the sodium lights and they replaced their street lights with LED lights, which are giving nice bright white light. And so they're just showing you the difference. But anyway, you've seen these street lights uh, in the community. And so you should be able to figure out the electron configurations for any of the levels in these Grotrian diagrams. So if you're kind of dozing off, this is, a, this is what I'm telling you. You should be able to figure out the electron configurations for any of these levels. Okay. So this bottom one is the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that's that neon core, and then 3s1. And the next one, we've moved that electron over to the 3p, but we've left the neon core alone. Okay. And the next one is a D column. And so what would the D be? be would it be 3D, yes, okay, so then, oh, the, the next highest one is the 4S1, then you have the 3D1, okay, 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3D1, and then we go up, and now it's in another column, so what column is that going to be, what's after D, are you awake, F, exactly, so then the next one uh, up here is the 4F1, what if I didn't give you this bottom one, what if I gave you the second one in that column? going up. So that would be neon core, and you could write it this way. I was just showing you all of the electrons just to, to reemphasize the point. So what's the next one up? It's still in the F column, so we know it's an F. It's still one electron, so we know it's an F1. It's just going to be the next highest N value. So if the lower one was the 4F1, this is the 5F1. Make sense? So they just go up in quantum number N in that column. They're all F1s, but it's 4F1, 5F1, 6, 7, 8, 9, until you can't even see the differences. Then we have the G. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, it keeps going up. Okay. Just higher angular momentum. We just don't have any G orbitals in the ground state atoms, but in the excited state atoms, absolutely. So that would be the 5G. If the 4F is the smallest F orbital, 
then for the g orbital, then the 5 g orbital would be the smallest g orbital. Uh, the first g orbital, I should say. And then h and i, and that's as high as this uh, Grotrian diagram goes. So there's a 7i orbital. What's the quantum number here? What's the L quantum number? Little l equals what for i? Just go back to s. Uh, little l equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. And also you can look at that n equals 7 and, and l is for this highest one it would be n minus one, and so that would be six. So that's the first time you would see an I uh, orbital. Okay. Uh, what is, so L equals six, let's just have some fun again. M sub L is equal to what set? It goes from minus six all the way to plus six. Minus six, minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So those are all the M sub L values. And those shapes would be crazy. All of these little lobes like the F orbitals and everything that would be going in all different directions. Okay. And so how do we figure this out? Well, we look down there at the bottom and it gives us these helpers. So notice how this is uh, just giving us the 2p6, that's sort of the ending of our standard electron configuration, and then it says ns. It doesn't say ns1, it's just implied. If it's not listed, it's implied that it's a 1. So ns, so this is a 3s, this is the 4s, this would be the 5s, the 6s, and so on, all the way up. Okay, the next column, 2p6, np. So that's telling you all of those are p orbitals, and that's how I knew this one over here was an i. It was an n i. I just gotta know what the first i could be. So I just worked my way up. The first p is a 2p, then the 3d, 4f, 5g, uh, 6h, 7i. So you can just work your way up the bottom of all of those columns, and you can figure that out. So that's the Grotrian diagram for sodium. It's not too bad, but more complicated certainly than hydrogen. Now let's get crazy since we have mercury lights in the room. These mercury vapor lights are what are in our fluorescent lights. And why do we like mercury? Mercury's toxic, okay? Why would we have mercury in our rooms and educational facilities? What are they trying to kill us? You know, in fact, you do want to be very careful not to break those. <laughs> and the curly bulbs that you have in your house also, you don't want to break those. There's mercury vapor in there. Most of it's not vapor, but when you heat it up, then it's, it's vapor and it's giving light. And so this is the difference here, the sodium lamp and the mercury lamp. Now this is kind of a cold mercury lamp and I'll show you why in a second, but you see how green it is. I don't know if you've ever taken phot photographs in a gym, if you ever, I was a high school annual photographer and taking pictures of volleyball teams and so on in the gym, all my pictures were green because they had mercury vapor lamps. And so the most sensitive part of my camera element was picking up those green photons of light and uh, everybody looked really, their skin tone was bad and the green lights and, and everything like that. Although one time I got this great photo because the, the lights are also blinking, you know, they're like pulsing and you don't really see it with your with your eye. But my camera exposure was too long. And so this this slam on this volleyball player, uh, the blinking got her arm here and here and here and here. It was so cool. It was like it wasn't a blur. It was like four distinct positions of her hand as she slammed it. And it was picked up on the yearbook. I was like greatest photo ever <laughs> okay but anyway the mercury lights make everything kind of green colored until they get hot enough and you'll see why so here's the spectrum the spectral lines. so we have the energy level diagram and we have the spectral lines and this is why we still use mercury in our room lighting because it gives us red photons and green photons and blue photons and those all hit the three pigments in our eyes and so we see white light even though a lot of wavelengths are missing, we just see that it tickles those three pigments and our brain says, oh, I'm getting light from all three parts of the spectrum. I have red, I have green, I have blue. It looks white to me, right? And so that's, that's good. And even has a little yellow and a little bit of blue green. Okay. 
And so let's figure out the electron configurations for this crazy Grotrian diagram, all right? Now, down here at the bottom, we have a lot more complicated setup. We have 5D10, okay, which if we look at Mercury, yeah, it's 5D10. But then over here, it says then 6S, okay, and then it says NS. So NS is the thing that's changing. So it's one of those S electrons on Mercury that's hopping all over the place. So the 5D subshell is just stable. It's not moving around. The one thing that's moving around is that one, uh, it has 6S2, and it's one of those S electrons that's hopping around, giving us all of these different atoms. And so uh, this first one right here is going to be the 5D10 6S2. But it's not the ground state for this for this mercury. Uh, the lowest energy one is an NP. So what's the next P orbital on the mercury row? So you see how you have to be good with the electron configurations. You have to be able to look at the periodic table and say, all my electrons are filled up to 5D10. The next available one, see that six? It'll be the six Ps. So this bottom one here is going to be this electron configuration. Xenon core, and we've been through the first row of the, the lanth let's see, those are the lanthanides. So 4F14, so we have all of those 14 electrons in the 4F, it's filled. Then we have the 5D10, those are filled, and it's the 6S electron that's hopping around, and in this case, it's in the P orbital. It's in the 6P1. And apparently moving that electron to the P orbital allowed the whole atom to drop in energy. And so that's the lowest energy we see on this energy level diagram. Crazy, but that's what we have, okay? And then the next one, it's in the P column. So instead of the 6P, what do you think it'll be? It'll be the 7P. Not much difference. We just put that electron in the 7P. Everything else is the same. Then the 8P, then the 9P. So it's pretty simple once you get that bottom one. You just go up, you just raise the quantum number of that single electron that's hopping around, and we move that electron, and now the whole atom has a different energy, and that's what's being plotted. Okay, then we have the 6s2, the 7s1, so a 6s1, 7s1. Then we're over here in the D column, 6s1, 6d1, and then uh, we could put both electrons in the 6p. So if we go down here, uh, this column is 6, uh, let's see. I think that one's incorrect. I, I was trying to label, I've, I've, I've shifted this around, so um, this one is actually here in this column. It should be right there. Because it's a 6P2, and down here I have 6PNP. So things have changed now. I no longer have any S electrons. I have one in the 6P and one in some other P. Okay, so it could be 6P2 or 6P7P, 6P8P, and so on. Now here's the actual... Um, prediction of the mercury spectrum from the atomic spectral database and and this is showing that the hg1 that's the ground state hg or unionized hg and this is hg2 which is hg plus so the cation is in there too and that the red spectrum shows that that red spectral line is actually from the mercury cation so that's why these lights look green until they warm up until we get some mercury cations in there, we don't have any red light. And so our eye sees the blue and the green photons and the yellow, and it looks a little greenish uh, and, and blue-green color. And then once that light really warms up, then we start getting red photons from the mercury cation. And you would not be able to figure that out without this atomic spectral database uh, from NIST. Okay, these are the three visible lines of the mercury atom, but not the cation, and we can actually see the relative intensity here. And so, you know, this one has an intensity of 400. There's lots of other spectral lines, but look at their intensities. They're garbage, right? We're not going to see those lines. And then we have an 1100, nothing, and a 240. And these are the three main lines here and here, and then 240 is this one right here. Now, we would have to generate this whole table again for the mercury cation, before we would see that red line. This is only the mercury atoms. And so that's a pretty deep dive into atomic spectroscopy. 
but it's still the same thing you've been learning energy levels and the spectral lines are the arrows between them and if you can understand that concept of spectral lines our differences between energy levels then you can understand complicated stuff like this all right we'll see you next time